Hello, everyone, and welcome to Outcasts and Outsiders as part of the Brooklyn Book Fest. Um, my name is Ryan Chapman. I am very thrilled to be moderating this panel with our uh, esteemed writers. Um, if you would like to hear their uh, incredible bios, you're going to have to press the button on the Brooklyn Book Fest website because if I were to read all of their accomplishments and their great works, I would eat up far too much of their time and we are not here to listen to me. So I will just say very quickly that I am very excited to have with us today um, from Portland, Oregon, Lydia Yuknovich, um, whose most recent book is the short story collection, Verge. Um, and we have with us from Tucson, Lydia Millet, whose novel, A Children's Bible, came out this spring and is um, long listed for the National Book Award. Um, and then um, lastly and not leastly, we have coming in from Los Angeles, Hector Tobar, who's the author of The Last Great Road Bum, a novel um, which is also recently published. Now, um, oh, and I'm supposed to do this to make my publicist happy. This is my book, right, as I have known. Okay, so um, it's um, very exciting. Between our three uh, panelists, uh, they have published 28 books ranging from um, memoir, academic criticism, young adult books, works of investigative journalism. It's quite amazing. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, and uh, uh, I would also like to note, if you would like to ask a question, please do so through Crowdcast. I will be kind of checking it um, throughout and then incorporating the questions into the discussion um, or at the end, kind of whenever is most convenient. Um, please ask um, any and all questions. And um, also I want to uh, note that you can purchase our author's amazing books at the Center for Fiction. Um, I think the buy button is close to the uh, Crowdcast um, screen. The Center for Fiction is wonderful. You'll be supporting our authors and a great arts nonprofit um, based in Brooklyn. Um, and then um, I also just wanted to say, you know, um, we all can't, can't be in person in, in Brooklyn for a lot of obvious reasons. Um, if you have those reasons in mind, one of the advantages of watching from the safety of your own home or wherever you are is that if you wanted to uh, scream about the frustrations of the world or the news of the past week or two, you can do that at any time. And I would even encourage that. Um, I uh, can't do that because I'm moderating, but um, to all the audience members out there, if you want to have like a, a quick yell at the universe, please do so. Um, okay. So um, we're, enough for me. I think we're gonna get started with um, a, a uh, brief reading from our uh, authors from their newest books. Um, and um, uh, we're, we decided on the naming conventions since we have two Lydias today. We're gonna go with um, Lydia Tucson and Lydia Portland. <laughs> um, and if I could in <laughs> invite um, Lydia Tucson to, um, start uh, our, our readings first from a uh, children's Bible. So sure. Thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks to anyone who's out there. I can't actually see how many or who you are on my particular Zoom interface, but I'm just going to read about a, I think I'll just read about a page. This is from, um, yes, this book, a children's Bible, and it's about a group of um, teenagers and children who are spending the summer with their parents sort of against their will in this um, kind of robber baron mansion in the country and uh, who are playing a game in which they avoid being associated with the parents that belong to them. And so I'll just read about a page about, about, about the parents, I guess. Later, the talk grew louder, freed of our influence some of them emitted sudden harsh barks, apparently laughing. From the wraparound porch with its bamboo torches and hanging ferns and porch swings, moth-eaten armchairs and blue light bug zappers, the barks of laughter carried. We heard them from the tree houses and tennis courts and from the field of beehives, a slow neighbor woman tended in the daytime, muttering under the veil of her beekeeping hat. We heard them from behind the cracked panes of the dilapidated greenhouse or on the cool black water of the lake where we floated in our underwear at midnight. I like to prowl the moonlit grounds by myself with a flashlight, 
bouncing its spot over walls with white shuttered windows, bicycles left lying on the grass, cars sitting quiet on the wide crescent drive. When I came into earshot of the laughter, I'd wonder that any of them, any of the parents, could actually have said something funny. As the evenings wore on, some parents got it into their heads to dance. A flash of life would move their lumpen bodies. Sad spectacle. They flopped, blasting their old time music. Beat on the brat, beat on the brat, beat on the brat with a baseball bat, oh yeah. The ones with no flashes of life sat in their chairs watching the dancers, slack-faced, listless, for practical purposes, deceased, but less embarrassing. Some parents paired off and crept into the second floor bedrooms where a few boys among our number spied on them from between the slats of closet doors, saw them perform their dark acts. At times they felt stirrings, I knew this, although they did not admit it. More often, repugnance. Most of us were headed to junior or senior year after the summer was over, but a few hadn't even hit puberty. There was a range of ages. In short, some were innocents. Others performed dark acts of their own. Those were not as repugnant. That's it. Thank you, Lydia. Um, um, Hector, do you mind if we uh, invite you to read next? Um, sure. Um, this is um, from my novel, The Last Great Road Bum. And um, it is from uh, a chapter in which Joe Sanderson, my hero, is in El Salvador. And he's guiding um, a group of refugees away from an army offensive. He's a guerrilla soldier uh, guiding these refugees. And um, his, his gnome de guerre is Lucas. So he's Joe and he's Lucas. Whoops. <laughs> Señora, más rápido, por favor. Or should it be señorita, since she's so young? But that would be sort of an insult, too, because speed it up, young lady. Yeah, I know you're carrying a load there. Hey, you, help her. Help her. Let me help you help her. Take her by the arm, and I'll take up the other, up and over this mossy rock. I see, I see. If she falls, she might have the baby right here. Freckled face, mother to be, icy river water at her thin ankles, holding my wrist with her thin arms, barely 20, I guess. We guide her spidery form up over the stream, her a big belly at the center of her stringy limbs, and me and her and this boy at the center of a line of 2,000 people stretched out over this canyon, climbing down one side and up the other. The Comandancia and the assorted rebel columns up ahead, the civilians here in the middle with the kids from the school to help me and a bumming rebel named Lucas. Behind us, the radio station crew, burdened down with all their equipment, including the precious radio transmitter with its subversive transistors and diodes and dials. Very dangerous spot, this river. Lucas and the pregnant girl reached the other side and they stopped while the girl caught her breath and Joe looked up to scan the high ground around them, and he worried the radio people might get ambushed here, and he yelled out, rapido, rapido, todos rapido. He watched the children from the school bound across, bound across the rocks, unafraid, at play. And then one boy stopped suddenly and looked up at the sky, and the entire line of crossing children paused also and turned their eyes upward as if they were obeying a command the first boy had transmitted via telepathy. Look! Before he saw the helicopters, Joe heard the cardiac beat of their engines. Death up there above us, and Lucas took two steps back into the stream to order everyone out. The helicopters disappeared to the north. They were high up and in a hurry. Nothing to fear. And now up the scrubby hillside, Vos, vení, he calls out to a boy. Vos también, to a second boy. He appoints them personal escorts to the pregnant senorita. Help this young woman to the top of the hill and I'll give you a medal, the Illinois Medal of Valor. And the boys scamper down to grab the spider girl and guide her up the hill. Good, she'll move faster now. And finally, Lucas joins the tail end of the column, the school children and marches up behind them. And he thinks that this is an undeniably noble place to be, guiding children to safety. St. Joe the Valiant, and, is it, and if this isn't a character in a book, but who cares about literature now? Not Joe, no one, 
Everyone wants to live, to breathe. Thank you. Um, excellent. I mean, I, whew, it's like, I, I know what happens after that run. And it's like, I was like, my heart was beating again so fast. Um, so um, uh, uh, Lydia Portland, can we ask you to read um, uh, from Verge? Sure. I just want to say again, what a great pleasure it is to be joining you all. I've read all your work and I've, I love you so much. So let me fangirl for a tenth of a second. Um, this cover, Verge, uh, represents how I feel in life right now. It's a beautiful psychedelic rainbow with a, a snarling wolf in the center. <laughs> and most of the stories inside could, could fit that description too. I'll just read a little bit from a story called The Organ Runner, which is something like a cross between a folktale and a resistance narrative. For six months, when she was eight years old, Anastasia Radovic's entire left hand was grafted to her ankle just above her foot. She'd been run over by a combine harvester in a wheat field, completely severing her hand from her arm, though she'd worked in the fields with her family since she was five and was thus considered a skilled laborer. A three second glance away as the combine harvester passed her row of youths, their hands low to the ground, was time enough for the tragedy to occur. The hand was too badly damaged to reattach immediately, so the doctors detached it to her ankle to let it heal, a risky procedure for even the world's best doctors, but in her part of the world, the doctors were often newcomers, eager to hone their skills at the latest procedures in an area with plentiful patience and little regulation. In an area where six months later, doctors reattached her hand to her wrist. It took several operations before the feeling returned, the pink color gradually improving with her blood flow. And eventually she regained some use of her hand, but she never forgot how it looked growing from her ankle. Two parts of her body seemed together in a way they should never have been. She remembered resting in a hospital bed, staring down at the hand foot, wondering if they told each other secrets she remembered at night the other children in the state hospital whimpered a little like animals, crying themselves to alone sleep, some of them more or less abandoned. This went on for months and months as Anastasia healed and she thought of her hand lodged at her foot and it made her think of chimps, the way they run with the backs of their hands to the ground and their feet grabbing at things for traction and her dreams filled with primates. And she imagined herself running and running, a girl running with her hands before she became an organ runner. How oh, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> um, that story also has just like a, um, like slap in the face of an ending and it was one of my favorites in the collection. Um, so I wanted to um, kind of open up with our with our first kind of question just about kind of the the title of the panel. Um, you know, outcasts can um, have a lot of different meanings, and I and I think it is always defined against maybe a monolith which may or may not exist. I think one of the better ways I've been thinking about it is is just in terms of like unheard voices or, or underheard voices, and I was curious about. Um, you know, how you, you chose to focus on the characters in your most recent books. I know um, the story behind how Hector came across the real life Joe Sanderson is very fascinating. And I remember, if I remember correctly, um, that with Verge, Lydia, there were some characters that were kind of drawn from, from friends and from people in your own life, which I, I know can be uh, 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 perilous or rewarding. Um, so I was curious, um, kind of how you came to the characters and then also, I guess, related on um, what it has been like, you know, incorporating real life people into your fiction. Um, maybe uh, uh, we could start with Hector and then um, hear about the real Joe Sanderson. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Ryan, and thanks to the Brooklyn Book Festival for having us. Um, yeah, so Joe Sanderson was a real person who left behind um, about a half dozen unpublished novels and maybe about 
four or 500 letters at least that I had access to. Um, yeah, I, you know, I just thought this was a person who had lived an incredible adventure. He was uh, a white guy from a college town, um, a college dropout who had circled the world hitchhiking then joined this rebel army. And, um, you know, I, I thought of him as someone who, whose life I wanted to occupy, whose voice I wanted to occupy. I wanted to have his eyes, you know, for the, what is it, five, six years that I worked on this because Joe, before he joined the rebels in El Salvador, he circled the world. You know, he went to Vietnam during the war and he went to all these crazy places. He was a, a medic in Nigeria during the horrible civil war there. And so, you know, I, I, I really felt like the opportunity to become um, to travel to these places and to sort of be a writer in these places, you know, and then El Salvador. I mean, I mean, that was Joe's mission at the end of his life was to write a novel about the civil war and revolution in El Salvador um, and to bring it home to American readers, you know, to do what Hemingway had done with the Spanish civil war and for whom the bell tolls. That's what Joe wanted to do. But unfortunately, he was a terrible writer. And unfortunately, he died in, in, in this particular war before he could, uh, he could even begin to write his novel. But he left behind, you know, uh, at least a three, one 380 page journal that I had access to in many letters. And so, you know, I, I wanted to be that outsider. I wanted to be that person. I never had I would never have the courage to join a rebel army. I mean, you know, I was when the, when Joe was living these events uh, in El Salvador, he was uh, 39 years old. You know, he was actually very, very old for a rebel. You know, he was there with a bunch of teenagers. I was a teenager in 1982 and I could have gone, uh, you know, I could have joined the rebels in El Salvador, but I didn't because I'm a bookish, uh, you know, uh, shy uh, American kid, suburban American kid at that time in my life. And so the, the opportunity to live this life vicariously and to and to play with it, um, to play with his life and and enter all the imagery that he lived and the language that he tried, uh, he tried to find the language to describe all the amazing things that he had done. And so when you, I think, you know, this is outsiders and outcasts, you know, outsiders put themselves in situations of, um, of danger. They put themselves in situations uh, in which they, they, they want to be close to beauty, you know, the, the beauty of human courage. That's what Joe was trying to do. He wanted to be in the presence of that beauty. And, um, and so uh, I, I really, really enjoyed, uh, you know, doing, doing that and, and becoming him and, and recreating the Salvadoran Revolution, among many other things in my novel. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Lydia Portland, um, I know the, um, can you speak on some of the, I came kind to of the characters and I'm also fascinated by the, the real world people who made it into Verge. Well, I mean, define real. <laughs> Um, every story in Verge is indeed a kind of um, homage to a real person I've met in my life or who is currently in my life. But, you know, I don't know any people who had their hand attached to their foot, right? Although I do know someone who was an organ runner. <laughs> um, and a lot of the people I chose to build storytelling around are... are experience their identities as in-between people or people who aren't seen or given respect enough to count in the world unless they enter a narrative that pre-exists them. So, you know, if you're an organ runner, you're immediately already a criminal. And there's another story in which there's a girl who has been sucked into the sex trafficking world and, and she's sucked into a narrative of being a victim um, in a kind of popular culture, mono narrative. And I wanted to liberate the bodies and the stories of these in-between people with narratives already waiting out there to suck them into some binary. I wanted just to give them time and space with their own bodies and stories. And that's why so many of the stories don't fully conclude um, I, you know, worked very hard to resist conclusion and tried to leave the reader in a place where it would be impossible to not see this person in the ending building. Like that's the only goal I had for every single ending. And you're right, occasionally I also threw in a gut punch, but really the thing was, <laughs> uh, can you feel this person in your body and admit they exist? 
and that they may have their own stories and you don't know what they are and how might we reorient to each other and to the people we spend so much time trying not to see, how might we reorient to each other and to each other's stories? And so maybe some of the stories succeed, maybe they don't succeed, but that was the effort to lovingly, you know, um, open story back up to bodies that are too often erased and in some cases literally disappeared. Yet I think it's, it's um, one of the chief strengths of the collection is how, while there's also kind of a, a literal geographic breadth to the stories, um, there's also, you kind of map the, the internal geography of, uh, of the internal experience, the, uh, whether it's um, um, born of trauma or violence or, or um, just the, the difficulty of living life um, from all these different perspectives. And, you know, it's, it's um, like, it's a slim collection in a way, but I wouldn't advise people to read it quickly because of that breadth of experience. It's good to like pause and, and really like digest um, um, the stories. Um, I, I want to um, also ask, um, bring in uh, Lydia Tucson um, now and ask about um, kind of the, the genesis of children's Bible. Um, and you have the kind of unfortunate case of, of the curse of Cassandra where this book may have been speculative or dystopian a few years ago, but now it's environmental collapse and the, um, uh, uh, the, the way that the parents behave here um, is uh, uh, that um, I guess all too real. Um, so I'm curious kind of uh, uh, where that came from and, and um, kind of how you decided to also write the book from the, the teenagers and uh, perspective. Well, so I was um, also in a sense writing, uh, writing about people I know in that, but in a, in a different, well, I guess we all are, all of us on this panel in, in different ways doing this. The projects are pretty distinct that way in the subjectivity they're looking at. But um, I particularly wanted to write about the, the rage of, and the anger of um, people now in particular in this country that are my, the, my children's age. And I wanted to, um, and I sympathize, well, I feel that anger even though I'm middle-aged. Uh, and I've been sort of, um, I, I don't know, uh, felt frozen for many years and stunned, sort of stricken by the lack of anger at, um, at the sort of staggering toll of destruction that my generation and those older um, have chosen to allow to occur in the natural and sort of physical life support of the world. And, um, and I see now, I see now a lot of, um, you know, a lot of young people who are really angry at us and at power structures. And, but I think at the same time, we all, there's a way in which all people who aren't, I don't know, um, in, in extraordinarily powerful positions or running corporations or whatever. There's a way in which all of us feel shut out and disempowered in the face of these, these sort of vast changes that are occurring. Um, so I was writing about the children, but in a way could have been writing about any of our feelings of um, sort of grief and rage and fear of the future. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, actually, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I was going to ask Hector and Lydia also if, if rage kind of is a fuels your fiction writing as well. Um, Hector. Um, well, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, it comes down to being a, a Guatemalan kid, you know, son of immigrants, and it's the rage of not being heard. You know, it's the rage of being an outsider to American literary culture. I mean, you know, I, I've worked 25, 30 years, um, you know, to get to where I am, um, you know, and I, I'm extremely privileged among uh, American writers of any kind, but especially among Latino writers. And so there's that. And then there's also 
the rage of of this experience that happened in Central America, of um, you know we're talking about an empire that imposed its will on one of the tiniest countries of the Americas and massacred its most um, idealistic and bright and beautiful people. You know, a lot of the novel is about about these bright, beautiful young people taking up arms, you know, girls at 16, 17 years old, uh, you know, university students who, who are writing each other love poems in between battles, you know, and, um, and just that, that something so beautiful will be, would be crushed with, with napalm and, um, you know, with counterinsurgency strategies. Yeah, absolutely. It's like screaming out against, and now screaming out against it all being forgotten. You know, this is an episode which 99.9% .9 of the American people have never heard of, you know, or, or they wouldn't be able to, to recount it. And it was all paid for with their tax dollars. You know, there's uh, Joe Sanderson in one of his letters, or excuse me, in his diary, recounts finding a bomb that was dropped on one of these rebel camps that and he, he it did not explode and he could see the markings at the uh, El Mosote um, massacre site, one of the worst massacres in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Um, the bullets were manufactured uh, in Missouri. And so, yeah, absolutely. There is this sense of just um, uh, of a rage against forgetfulness and a rage against injustice. And Lydia Portland. It's part of my, I'm sure part of my life journey to figure out how to orient to rage. <laughs> I can't seem to quit, quitter. <laughs> um, but a little to riff off what Hector was saying, um, it's it's just mind blowing to me how a certain story of rage got legitimized if we take America as an example or the US as an example. You know, the wanting to not be persecuted and build a country that was would resist the imperialist power is buried the rage of everyone underneath it. And so one story of rage became legitimized and the genocide and brutality and any other kind of rage was buried underneath it so we could tell ourselves this great story of a country. And it's not just America, but America's on my mind right now. So it's a global story of the oppression of, of some people so that other peoples can advance and call themselves civilized and progressive. Um, and so there's that that one kind of rage which robs um, people who are then used as the raw material for you know, this rage story to exist. That rage pisses me off <laughs> that it gets the legitimacy. And so I'm interested in digging down to find the rage that could save us, the rage that might be generative of identity and human and planetary um, coexistence. You know, that other rage is the rage we need to go find and embrace and, and uh, dig up because the rage that's dominated the planet so far is some bullshit. Yeah, well put. I think it, it reminds me of, um, you have that great uh, craft talk um, that you gave at Tin House, um, maybe uh, uh, I think 2018, and. If people can go to the Tin House website to find it. And you you cited the Toni Morrison line about that in times of crisis, the response of writers is not, it, like is you must write through the crisis. You, you, you must process that, that rage and that despair productively and generatively. Um, and, you know, we are, we are going to skirt the edge of all getting uh, uh, super depressed and despairing on this panel and then skirt right off the edge into, into uh, uh, craft literature again. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask the, the three of you um, kind of, you know, about, you know, if, um, you know, your relationship to, to fiction writing has changed this year, um, if you find yourself being drawn to writing um, more in other forms. Um, I know, Hector, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of um, kind of uh, uh, up to the moment um, uh, journalism, um, for uh, the New York Times amongst other uh, places, but um, and even in terms of, I guess, larger uh, projects, fiction or non. Um, and I'll just, um, maybe uh, uh, Lydia Tucson, if we could start with you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, sure. So, um, well, actually, yes. So this year, I've been I've been working on something throughout the pandemic, but also the few months before, uh, working on something that's not fiction, a book that's it's actually a, a bestiary. Well, I'm calling it a personal bestiary, but it's about extinction and um, religion and politics and sort of um, things that I like to think about and also has some stuff about my personal self, which <laughs> was really awkward to um, to do at first, but um, I'm trying not to be embarrassed to write about myself directly. Anyway, uh, it's mostly about other things, sort of using myself as a, um, you know, as a character in, as a, yeah. Anyway, um, but I, I've been happy to be working on it, particularly in this time, because it allows me to, to think directly in, because, you know, I mostly only think by writing. It's my thinking when I'm not writing, I think is, is sort of deficient. <laughs> so it's allowed me to think um, about, directly about the matters before us and sort of the interconnection and uh, of all of it, the sort of exploitation of wildlife and of people and um, just how clear it is that all these forms of oppression come from the same place. And it's been uh, good to be writing directly for me anyway, about these things. And of course, fiction can be equally um, direct in its own way. It's just that uh, I'm sort of a literal minded person. <laughs> and uh, so for me, um, this was helpful to be working on uh, and made me feel as though I was at least within myself addressing things um, actively when I couldn't be in the world actively. Uh, and I loved what Lydia um, Portland said about forms of rage, because I have been thinking about that a lot, too. And the sort of unthinking, unthinking anger and sort of hatred um, of the other uh, versus really what I, I do think can be a righteous, a righteous rage and um, an uprising uh, and resistance um, and and. I've been thinking a lot about how to distinguish those those forms of rage. So, yeah, indeed, um, Lydia Portland, um, have uh, over to you. I, I imagine you you processed a lot of this year through through writing, and um, has it changed kind of what you've been writing, and working on? Probably. I mean, I uh, hell, I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's all the writing is always changing and challenging me and morphing and you know disagreeing with itself but I cop to the fact that I'm a oh my god I can't even use that word I confess that um, I cannot write nonfiction without simultaneously writing fiction and that for better or worse I am that person and maybe we all are because I see my comrades doing this <laughs> as well <laughs> And uh, what happens is that they feed each other, they interrogate each other, they, the two forms stop being separate from each other. They absolutely are not binary to each other ever again. Um, and so it's like an organism that is allowed to become, and sometimes it moves toward nonfiction and sometimes fiction. But the whole point for me in my personal life is come at this shit with any form you've got any form you're capable of. Draw it, paint it, sing it, dance it, fiction it, nonfiction it. If I could write a poem to save my life, I would do that too, but I'm like the world's worst poet. I'm, I'm too mouthy and obnoxious. I can't make poetry. Um, but, you know, the beauty is that form itself is so endlessly capable mm -hmm. of agitating that... Um, I guess I'm just here to help recruit people to explore all forms and see which ones you can get to come out of you. And it kind of doesn't matter which one's coming out of you. It'll be the one that needs to be most urgent. Um, but let the forms speak to each other inside you to grow your own practice. Um, and I get excited talking about form because form is almost everything for me as a, as a prose writer. 
um, which is usually the thing poets say. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have some cross wires, so whatever. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and that's actually um, a great um, segue to Last Great Road Bum because the novel is a, like an incredible experiment in form where the, the fictional subject of the non-fictional investigation is sometimes snarkily fighting Hector in the footnotes. And if you ever wanted to read a book where the, the main character uh, argues against the author in a kind of like high uh, comic style, then, then Last Great Road Bum is, is uh, also for you. Um, so Hector, I, I don't know if you want to talk about form or, or also kind of um, expand what uh, Lydia was saying on um, how you're, you're um, kind of reacting to 2020 with your writing. Well, I, I, you know, as regards to form, I think I've been working simultaneously in fiction and fiction for 30 years now. I mean, you know, ever since I was working at the LA Times in the 1990s, late 1980s, I decided I wanted to be a, a novelist. And I was working at a newspaper during the day writing nonfiction. And at night, I'd write fiction. And ever since then, I've been working back and forth between projects very often simultaneously. Um, and that I've never stopped. I just really, I totally agree with uh, with, uh, with with um, both Lydia's uh, about how the these <laughs> forms. Uh, how often can I say that? Um, that these two forms feed off of each other so much. You know, they they completely feed off of each other. Um, I I you know right now I'm writing a nonfiction book. I'm in I'm, I'm at Harvard um, uh, for a year doing a fellowship to write a nonfiction book. Um, but that nonfiction book itself is informed by the imagination and by you know, the wordplay of fiction and and all of the emotional spaces that fiction goes to so easily, but that nonfiction doesn't necessarily, you have to sort of drag nonfiction kicking and screaming and you have to sort of do all of these uh, crazy things to make nonfiction reach those emotional spaces. And so, yeah, in, the, in this book, I, I found myself sort of in between both places, you know, I mean, mostly I was in fiction. Um, but just really um, just enjoying that process where there were no boundaries, you know, uh, obviously, I mean, for me, the one rule about, about a novel is that, uh, excuse me, the one rule about nonfiction is that, that, you know, the pact with the reader is that everything in it is true, right? Um, and so I wrote a book about the Chilean miners, a nonfiction book. All of it is true, right? Uh, to the best of my ability. Um, but with Joe, there was stuff I made up. And as soon as you make up one thing, it's a novel, <laughs> you know? It's like being a little bit pregnant, <laughs> you know? Once you you step away from nonfiction, it becomes you, you, easier and safer to call, uh, call it a novel. And I just really enjoyed so much just playing with that, with that book and playing between the two forms and just letting my imagination go. And then, you know, and then when my imagination got tired going back to, the, to my source material, and, and just plowing through it and then finding another place where I could where I could play with it and collaborate with this guy who was dead, which is essentially what the novel is. It's a collaboration with a dead man. But I, yeah, I, I am totally, um, you know, uh, uh, absolutely on board with with the, the, that people should should work in both genres and, 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 and discover just how what a great marriage it is. You know, I'm, I'm like a, a writer who's you know, the two halves of my brain are married to each other and they, they're, they're having a great relationship and producing all these children. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm on my, I just gave birth to my fifth child, you know, and, and now working on the sixth. So yeah, it's, I, I, I absolutely agree. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to work. Um, and I, I um, want to also just uh, reiterate something from the beginning about if anyone here would like to ask, if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, you can do so on Crowdcast, and we have a question I'm gonna ask uh, Lydia Tucson in a moment, but I wanted to play off something uh, Hector said in that one thing I found really fascinating in all three of your work is also like how the, the books are working against kind of uh, established mythologies and, and sometimes they're, you know, they can be literal or not. And obviously the uh, Last Great Road Bum, there's the shadow of, of Kerouac and, and the beats and, um, Hector, I know you've spoken in interviews on like this gave you an opportunity to maybe fill in gaps and that there was there with um, Joe's mother in the book and that, mm -hmm. you know, Kerouac uh, was not known for his female <laughs> characters. Um, right. And um, in Verge, I love the story Cusp and how the teenage narrators 
kind of uh, uh, Shakespeare books gifted by her parents kind of win their way into this uh, uh, somewhat brutal story. Um, and then I think you can all guess the, the totem behind a children's Bible. Um, so I, uh, uh, we have a question uh, uh, for Lydia Tucson that I think all three of you can answer if you wish, but it goes back to um, um, something you were talking about with what drew you to, to writing the book. And it's that, you know, uh, uh, you know, how did we get here for lack of a, a better way of putting it? You know, you know what um, the, the parents in the novel um, are the, are the um, enablers um, of the, the destruction and then kind of turn a blind eye toward it. Um, and were there, um, you know, to some degree, the, the, the book is, is kind of the answer to this, this person's question. Um, so I'd invite them to read it um, or, or read it again. Um, but um, were there, um, you know, were there specific kind of uh, uh, ideas driving, you know, or, or causes that you're like, um, you know, this is how the boomers screwed us over? <laughs> uh, so wait, so sorry. So the question, I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what the question is. It's not just the boomers, by the way, because I'm not a boomer and, you know, I'm like Gen X and we, you know, uh, we're definitely, we're definitely there too. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so sorry, the, the parents, is it just a question about who the parents were or what sort of why yeah. I was interested in the parents or? Yeah, sorry. like why do you think they allowed the destruction? Um, why? Inside, oh. of it, outside of it, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there are plenty of things we can, I mean, the book I'm writing right now is all about that, how, how, we, how we allowed ourselves to um, lose so much, to lose so much of what we actually love, how that came about. And, and so, I mean, yeah, you can write a whole book about, I mean, it's a great question. <laughs> it's, um, uh, in this, just in a, to, to not take up too much time, um, in the context of this novel, uh, you know, I think it's, first of all, I feel culpable. Um, I, I, I feel culpable, you know, I am the parents in a sense. Um, I am the parents, although maybe not as excessive uh, at this time in my life as they are in the book um, in terms of self-indulgence. But we also, you know, we have different ways of indulging ourselves, right? There's so many material ways in particular in which uh, we indulge ourselves. They don't have to be illegal or um, um, intoxicating, you know. Uh, and so really, and so it's, it's, it's easy to sort of tar everything with the same brush. Um, really, I think when we assign blame specifically in regard to uh, in this novel, the climate crisis, but also, but also other forces like extinction, where really we should be assigning blame in a systemic way, uh, more than pointing the finger at individuals. And um, and so I didn't mean to sort of um, indict the parents as though as though they could have saved us you know that wasn't that wasn't really my assertion there more that it's so easy for us to go along with what we're told um with what we're told and it's so easy for us to be passive and um not to and not to fight for what is right you know and so and so this was just about the way a certain demographic of certain fairly privileged people has allowed itself to um, to go along. Yeah, I think you, you nailed it. I think you know, three of your books kind of are are a panacea to passivity. And you know, I, I was lucky to, to read all of them recently and felt like incredibly energized in all sorts of political and aesthetic and, and neck. Uh, uh, tingly ways. Um, I think we, we are about um, um, wrapping up. Uh, maybe if I could ask all three of you real quickly, if we can do it, I think we have like a minute. If um, 
we could ask you to end on maybe a, a, a piece of art or something that, that really turned you on um, uh, recently. Maybe we'll start with uh, Lydia Portland. Um, yes, pick me, pick me. My Octopus Teacher, the movie. Oh yeah, on Netflix, right? Yeah. Um, Hector? Uh, I just uh, watched with Mark. We have a family movie night uh, ever since the, uh, you know, we went into quarantine nine months ago, whatever it was. And we saw Burning, the great Korean movie. Yeah. Absolutely. So inspiring. Great movie about class and inequality and mystery and in Korea. So Burning, the Korean movie. Yeah, it's a wonderful film. Um, Lydia Tucson. Oh, I'm sorry. I think you might be on mute. Yes, I was. Sorry, it just always takes me a minute. Um, I was just going to say, actually, anything by W.S. Merwin has been making me feel sometimes hopeful, but also sad during this during this time. Uh, especially his prose. Read his prose, maybe. Thank you, and thank you so much, Ryan. By the way, for for reading our books. This is not always the case with thank moderators. You, so I really thank appreciate you. it. God Great God. job. You are a saint uh, among moderators. <laughs> yeah. I was lucky. This was like a gift. Um, you know, my phone just delivers up news notifications. It's made me want to jump into the river. And and your books uh, were um, uh, incredible. So I, I want to um, thank you, the three of you again. Um, and everybody who is watching, please read. I'm going to do this again. The Last Great Road Bomb, Verge, and A Children's Bible. Um, and um, if uh, I want to also thank the Brooklyn Book Fest and thank you, Center for Fiction. Um, and everyone have a, a safe um, and healthy uh, uh, rest of your Sunday. Um, and bye, everyone. <laughs>